California poppy is very palpable as a anxiolytic, calmative, soporific. And people take it and within a few minutes they're like, I feel more relaxed or I feel drowsy or I feel less anxious. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. I was very happy to sit down with Benjamin. He was one of my first ever herb teachers down at the East West School of Herbology in California. And I got to know him through his incredible and creative cooking while I worked in the kitchens down there. Benjamin also led herb walks and other classes during these seminars. Over the years, we've stayed in touch, and I've been so impressed with his important work in community medicine, formulation, and so much more. For those of you who don't already know Benjamin Zappin, he's an herbalist and licensed acupuncturist with over 25 years of clinical experience. He co-founded Five Flavors Herbs with his wife, Ingrid Bauer, to provide their community with exceptional herbal finished product and custom herbal formulations. Benjamin offers integrative herbal consultations through Paonia Integrative Medicine. In his free time, you'll find Benjamin cooking and studying music. Thank you so much for being here, Benjamin. I'm really excited to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Rosalie. Yeah, absolute pleasure. Well, as always, we get started by hearing a little bit about you and your path that's led you to us today and the different weavings that has brought you to the plant world. So I'd love to hear about that. Sure. So I, you know, grew grew up in California. I've, I've only lived in California and I moved to Santa Cruz, California and was at the right place in the right time uh, in the early mid nineties as there was, and there still is to different degrees, a very robust herbal medicine culture there with a traditional Chinese medicine school. At the time, there was a, a school called American School of Herbalism that was run by Michael and Leslie Tierra, our mutual teachers and how we know each other. Uh, Chris Hobbs, Roy Upton, uh, Bill Schoenbart, you know, these career herbalists that uh, I'm still colleagues and friends with they're almost 30 years later. Uh, and they, they held a container that infused us with inspiration about uh, the herbal industry, uh, herbs as primary medicine, herbs and perinatal conditions. You know, there's a lot of midwives in Santa Cruz uh, who are using herbs, uh, traditional Chinese herbs, wild native Western plants and botany. And, you know, just got, just got such a, strong inculcation into wonder and inspiration about all these different topics and um, try to try to keep up with all of them and mm. you know and am honored to represent different facets of that original training uh, i got to apprentice really early on with my close friend uh thomas avery garen and he had a small apothecary and i thought he was an adult at the time but i think he was only 25. um and you know, got to work in his apothecary and go wild crafting and have all sorts of adventures and and learn about you know learn about formulation, learn about formulation with wild native plants uh, that we were harvesting in the context of Chinese formulaic structures, uh, which was really his and Michael's jam, and um, you know that set a foundation for how I think about health and the body, medicinal plants. Cooking, uh, formulating, caring for individuals, etc. Uh, and then I went on to do a several, a four-year apprenticeship with Michael Tierra in his clinic, where I got licensed as an acupuncturist, uh, and you know, got to got to be in clinic with Michael at a time where 
there weren't the same quality of medical solutions to some of the things that uh, we got to treat a lot. So I got to work a lot with individuals with hepatitis C at various stages, cancer, HIV, AIDS, um, and you know, really, really got to see what herbs could and could not do. And you know, re really got a, a deep immersion into the powers of herbal healing and natural medicine uh, that I think is difficult to get. It was not easy to get then. I was at the right place at the right time with the right uh, right people queued up for me in this, you know, in this uh, incarnation. And and you were pretty young. You were pretty young. I was very young. I, I started yeah. taking classes at American school when I was 20. Yeah. So, and I was trying to think about it, Benjamin. I guess that we probably met in 2008 which if I'm doing math mm -hmm. correctly is like 15 years ago, which seems like not that long ago and a very long time ago. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And so I was a student at, it was then called East West School of Herbology. And I was a like a work study. I'd had like a scholarship or work study. And so I was in the kitchen. Oh boy. And um, so and that, how I remember it was like at least an hour of doing dishes after every meal and there's three meals. Um, and I think it was amazing for me to do that because I think if I had, like, you go to class for many hours, I think I would have, like, rested after class. But here I was, like, mm -hmm. you know, doing the dishes. And you were the cook for, I mean, how many people were there during these seminars? Like, hundreds. Yeah, I did that for 20 years. And 20 I, years. Think, I think the peak was about 100 people. There's 100 people. It, it got to where when numbers dropped below 60, it seemed easy. <laughs> and so those, you know, those that, that cooking 21 meals in succession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Breakfast, yeah, because it, it was a whole meals. week. Yeah, whole week. And you just made the most incredible meals. And my memory of you, Benjamin, is like one, the like, just the creative um, sense that in the smells and just everything. I mean, the food was just like every meal was something that we all talked about because um, it was talk worthy. And also music. That's kind of my my memories of you. Like there was always some kind of like eclectic music going on as the cooking was going on. Well, that's uh, uh, I, I I'm I celebrate those memories all the time. One one of my closest friends who I used to bring up from Mexico to cook with me, um, Nico, who you may or may not have met at that juncture, uh, he became the director of that facility. Hmm. So even though the, the tiers aren't doing their annual seminars. Now when I go to Santa Cruz, that's where I go because mm -hmm. our, our close family friend is there. Oh, fun, fun. Well, so I have an agenda today, Benjamin, because yeah. I'm excited to talk about California poppy, and we're going to dive into that in just a second. And then mm -hmm. I'm really excited to talk about formulation too, because that, like when I hear herbal formulation, in my mind, it's like there's Benjamin Zappin. So we're going to yeah. talk about that too. Um, but first, let's talk about California poppy. I love that you were born and raised in California, and now we're going to talk about California poppy. So, yeah, so you know, California poppy is the California state plant, and there's a popular myth that it's illegal to pick. There's probably been zero citations of people getting arrested or fined for picking it. Um, clearly, it's uh, inappropriate to pick in poppy preserves, and the good news is that it's really easy to grow and it's easy to grow as an annual. It will perennialize, that is, it'll go to seed um, and spread all over many different types of landscapes. You can grow it in diverse climate. Like as I mentioned, as an annual, you can grow it places where it snows, it snows where I live, it grows where I live. And it's really easy to grow. And so, you know, hallmarks to me of really good, herbs are that they're versatile. They can support a variety of uh, human discomforts, um, that they are easy to grow, that they're accessible. You know, I care about accessibility and because we want to promote a the people's medicine. Herbs as the people's medicine, herbs as things that we can enjoy. I know this is a charged term, but I believe in this term, health sovereignty, you know, independence over our own um, ailments and control of our vitality and sickness and health, um, California poppy is remarkable, you know, that it hits those hallmarks. It doesn't require a lot of expensive inputs. It doesn't require importation. It doesn't require a lot of gardening skill. And it's easy to make medicine that's really helpful. And so that's why I chose it. And that's why I keep 
choosing it and keep advocating for it. I, I don't know why it's never become really popular in part because it's not exotic enough to make exotic. Um, and I, you know, I've thought about this a lot. Like most of the major herb companies that do any kind of extraction use a lot of California poppy. And, you know, if you look at their products, like it'll be used in sleep formulas, it'll be used in anxiety formulas, it'll be used in analgesic formulas, because it's really useful for all these things. But it's never the featured thing that's, you know, front and center other than in a single. Um, and so uh, it's not a great tear, but it's bitter. So it's never going to be as palatable and um, as like a Tulsi Rose tea. Uh, but, you know, it, it's also really accessible in how it quickly it provides relief. And, uh, you know, when we're looking for how to, how to have gateway herbs, that is herbs that build people's trust that they're really powerful medicines. California poppy is very palpable as a anxiolytic, calmative, um, soporific. Uh, and you know, people take it and within a few minutes they're like, I feel more relaxed or I feel um, you know, drowsy or I feel less anxious, you know, the, all the ways people experience that. So But these days, who needs help feeling less anxious or going to sleep, Benjamin? Is that really relevant for our experience today? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, it, was, it was funny. Some, somebody, I showed up at a friend's house the other day and he said, I just took this thing you gave me, you know, four years ago and it really helped me relax. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, what, what did I give him? And, and it was, um, you know, we made a formula that was a mix of California poppy, St. John's wort, blue vervain and uh, artemisia mugwort all harvested at a christmas tree farm on the summer solstice like these were all just growing there and i macerated is, them all together is this the remain in the light formula yeah, yeah, good good memory yes, I, I was gonna yeah. bring up that formula so you beat yeah, me that, to that it was, that was a thing for a while so um you know formulas that a landscape presents us with is a is a formulation strategy mm -hmm. it's also a way to relate to spaces around you so so you know i had this in a jug for probably 10 years. And at some point I poured some out and said, Hey, take, you know, take this thing. Um, and I, in true form, I wrote the date on it and the name of it in a pen on a label to give to a friend. Um, and it was like, yeah, I took like five drops and it was amazing. I feel really relaxed. Um, this is really powerful. So I, I always like to share with people when they say, what's the expiration date on this? I said, the expiration date of the label is when you can't read it anymore and the contents are going to, you know, probably remain valuable for quite a while. Mm -hmm. so. um, that makes me very excited to jump into formulation. But before we do, just to backtrack a little bit on California poppy. Um, so what I'm hearing for you is kind of some of the main gifts are kind of um, anxiolytic or helping to calm the nervous system. You've mentioned sleep. And I believe you might have mentioned pain as well, analgesic. Yeah. Are those like in a nutshell why you're reaching for a California poppy or what would you add to that? Yeah, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, um, to, you know, there's, there's other, we, we could say to calm the mind, to still the mind, to support emotional quiet. Uh, if we look at TCM, well, I'm going to use the term energetics, even though that's a problematic term. Um, Function, uh, flavor, nature, chi, actions and indications. You know, we we'll say that it clears clears heat from the heart and the liver, both of a deficient and excess nature, and that it. Um, so you know, and th these can present as anger, as ADD and ADHD, as um, you know, profound anxiety, irascible advanced anger or low-grade petulant anger where, you know, we're thinking about, uh, you know, uh, like road, ra road rage, like mild road rage when you're in traffic and can't do anything about it, that real cheese stuck with some agitation uh, hmm. kind of feelings. So it's, yeah, so I mean, we, we can use this as a, 
pivot when we talk about formulas because how we're going to use it and get the most out of it is also going to depend on what we combine it with. Mm -hmm. you know, and so there, there's a lot of different condition specific types of scenarios that we might get value out of California poppy, you know, for different types of headaches or for tooth pain, uh, you know, different qualities of sleeplessness. It's not going to, it's not going to stop sleeplessness from hormonal dysregulation with, uh, you know, during menopause, but with the right type of formulation, it can be useful and supportive and an adjunct to a strategy related to that. Hmm. And so the recipe you've shared with us is how to make a simple, which is, you know, it's a California poppy simple tincture. And on there, you specifically call for fresh California poppy. And I wanted to mention that because that's a question I get a lot in my classes. Yeah. People want to know, you know, fresh versus dried specifically for tinctures. Do you feel like fresh is always best or what, what are your thoughts? Fresh versus yeah. dried? I, this is one of the herbs that I always prefer to access fresh and um, that's safe for me uh, because I always have access to it fresh. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we'll, we'll always have access to this as long as I live in California. And, and because we do some scale manufacturing, you know, we have access to farms that can ship it to us if that's what we need at scale. Uh, I would use it dry. I would use it in a tea. Um, I, th I think that's a reason, you know, it's available from suppliers. And I would encourage people to explore that if you don't have access to it and you want to make your own medicine, absolutely get it dried mm -hmm. and uh, give yourself an opportunity to compare and contrast. I don't want to dissuade people from exploring it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, and how about the parts to um, yeah. whole, you know, whole plant tincture versus, you know, if somebody only wanted to use the, you know, aerial parts, for example, do you have any experience yeah. with that or? Uh, it is purported that roots and seeds are the strongest, seed capsules are the strongest mm -hmm. part of California poppy. And most of what you're going to find in commerce is, that is, as a dried plant, is aerial portions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as, as I've been instructed, I still, still follow, depending on how much is available, uh, you know, I might leave the roots intact and harvest portions of the plant and leave the thing there to keep growing going to seed and not disturb the whole stand by removing individual plants. Mm. Or depend, if there's enough, if I plant it intentionally, it's in our property, uh, we might take up the whole plant once some of it's gone to seed and there's a variety of seed capsules. So I think that's, that's going to make the strongest medicine is a, uh, a whole plant tincture like that uh, in, in later in spring. You know, once it's gone to gone to seed, uh, in in that recipe, I think I recommend uh, you know a one to two one part plant to two parts uh, menstruum, and be between a seventy five to ninety five percent alcohol. I've made it with ninety five percent for a long time, and you know, kind of gradually started reducing that. Hmm. Um, this is another plant that it, it is a plant that I think makes a really nice glycerin hmm. and as a fresh plant glyceride, it extracts well. And so if you want to blend this with other sleep herbs as a glyceride, um, it, it'll do pretty well. There's a lot of water content hmm. to it. That's good to know. I've been getting really into glycerides lately. I've, I've been experimenting with making them quite a bit hmm. and, um, they're hit or miss. Hmm. In terms that of like what herbs work well in that menstruum. And yeah, like uh, <laughs> I just discovered today how poorly high pectin herbs extract into glyceride. Oh, and interesting. High, high pectin herbs make pudding and glyceride. Mm, so you have like hawthorn yeah. pudding right now or elderberry. I, I have <laughs> hawthorn pudding. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> and, you know, the, uh, the, Thanks for doing that for us. This will not Noted. be a R&D sample to present to a potential client. It will be a Christmas gift. <laughs> yeah, delicious, wonderful, heart supporting, but not oh, yeah, maybe yeah. coming out of a dropper. Yeah. No, I think it's gonna it's gonna be required to spoon out. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Pudding. Well, I unless you have anything else to add about California poppy, I feel like my head is buzzing with formulation questions and. Yeah, no, I, I think people should make it and experiment with it and try dosing at different ranges as mm. a simple. I think that um, this is something that, you know, one can hone their perception. And, you know, I, I re like herbs is a meditation tool. Some meditation schools will say you don't use anything to support your meditation. Part of the art is learning to relax without assistance. And when I want to relax, I might want to use something to assist me. And, <laughs> you know, uh, using five drops of California poppy, you know, three to five drops may be very powerful for some people. And mm -hmm. it really may support the qualities of quiet that we're seeking. Um, you know, um, and then, you know, taking five milliliters when you're in pain or really having a hard time sleeping, like really explore that gamut of doses and mm. see how it influences you, see how it influences people around you. You know, well, I appreciate you can, that. Yeah. So some provings like drink a bunch of coffee and then take a little bit of cow poppy to see how it takes the edge off. Uh, you know, listen to Democracy Now! and drink coffee and <laughs> see what it does for you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that about the dosing because that's something that I think it can be overlooked in terms of looking at plants and how they work for different people and something I've come to appreciate because I tend to like much larger dosages for mm -hmm. myself. Um, one way that I've worked with California poppy that hasn't been mentioned yet is for spasmodic coughs. And um, yes. like the kind of like the end of a cold where you like lay down at night and you're like, finally, I get yeah. to sleep. And then the cough starts and it's like the spasmodic cough that won't stop. California poppy, I'll just like take a dropper full. If I'm still coughing five minutes later, I take two dropper fulls. Um, and, you know, I just kind of keep that. I just keep going for it until I'm out and which it doesn't take that long. But um, I'm definitely more of that higher dosage. And I've come to appreciate, especially through clinical practice, that that's not the way for everybody. Some people do, you know, mm -hmm. the those five drops will do them kind of thing. So, um, do you find when you do that, that it makes you groggy in the morning? Um, I don't. And, but again, like, I wonder if that's just something, cause I do that with Valerian too, and I don't have mm -hmm. that grogginess, but I've heard that so often that I feel like I would never say that won't make you groggy. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. I just feel so good after getting to sleep, I think. So I just don't have yeah. that that return grogginess. And here yeah. I have been leaning on Robitussin when that happens to me. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It, my, it hasn't happened for a while, but that's... My magical formula is linden and um, red clover tea during the day. And then at night, just hitting up those antispasmodic tinctures in a, in a major way. So it works for me. Yeah, great. <laughs> Well, I'd love to talk about formulation. I feel like formulation can be a very mysterious subject, but a very sexy subject for a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, especially for people just beginning. There can be different areas of thought. Like a lot of people come at it from wondering, like worried, you know, like what herbs can't I combine? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what are going to be a problem if I combine? Um, then and there's just a lot of mystery to formulation. How do you combine, you know, how do you combine herbs? Why would you combine herbs? Um, if I have a cough, do I just look up 20 cough herbs and put them into some kind of recipe and then take them all? Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many different ways of thinking about formulation. And um, maybe let's mention five flavors herbs right now, because this is your and Ingrid's just incredible offering to the herbal world where you formulate and um, I'll let you talk about it, but I feel like you have a lot of background in formulation, so you're the per perfect yeah. person to ask about all this. Yeah. Um, I mean, as far as five flavors herbs goes, you know, we one of the resources that we provide that I care deeply about uh, that might not make us rich is our herbal pharmacy that allows individuals the freedom and flexibility to, you know, without stocking a big apothecary custom formulate, and mostly with liquid extracts, um, but also with granulated extracts of Chinese formulas. We've 
discontinued any remote service with bulk herbs because that's uh, loses money. Mm. Put it, <laughs> it's become, uh, visibly unsustainable to us. Uh, and we work, you know, a lot of what we do now is contract manufacturing. And so we're making herbal formulas for people who want to take their own brand out there. And, uh, you know, that, that's a mix of seasoned nutraceutical companies for whom we're supplying them, uh, as well as individuals with emerging brands that uh, either have a formula or want help with that. And so we, we help and nurture, uh, nurture people's passion and interest and uh, help, help people through their launch stage with um, pragmatic guidance. And mm. uh, so I, I love to formulate. I can formulate in my sleep and um, am working less as a clinician these days and more running our company. And so that's, that's where I'm looking for that outlet. Mm -hmm. it's, um, through, through that. So, but when, when working as a clinician for years, you're formulating all day long. Mm -hmm. well, I've fallen in love with um, many of your formulas. Of course, I can't not mention your pain formula. Um, pain and it's called pain in the dot, dot, dot. Is that right? Do I remember that correctly? Yeah, uh, it, it was, I think we called it MSK comfort, like musculoskeletal comfort, mm. because it got flagged somewhere that they said, you can't use the word pain. And we said, okay. Mm, so that's changed. So, yeah. Amazing formula. I use that formula um, when I my back used to go out all the time. And for anybody who's ever experienced that, um, I know it's a funny term, but it basically meant I was in like indescribable pain where I could not move whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And that formula wasn't like I was like suddenly doing back bends the same day, but it took off the like that incredible edge and I didn't have to resort to things like ibuprofen. And I would take that and I'd, you know, get the hot water bottle and put a fomentation on my back. And it was just like, it just gave me so much peace and like made my life so much more comfortable. I'm proud to say now my back doesn't go out very much because yeah. I'm strength training now. So that's good. Um, but I use that also I, when I had my, um, I had a tooth out and I also used it when I had a root canal. Both times pain meds were given and I didn't want to take them. I used that formula. So I'm it's just an incredible formula. That's just this wonderful herbal alternative to taking over the counter and sets or what have you. So incredible formula. I was going to bring up your remain in the light, which I, you, I can't remember when the last time I saw you at some conference and you gifted me that it was many years ago, feels like, but that was such a cool formula. And I think it did introduce me to what you said for, you know, landscape as a formula, which was this incredibly beautiful thing that I have used ever since. So want to talk about that. And then I also love, um, you know, my background is in Chinese medicine through the East West School. So we studied lots of Chinese formulas, lots of Chinese herbs. And I love how you westernize these classic Chinese formulas um, in your own way, too. So anyway, I want to hear about it all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, so I think for, for people who are just, ex, you know, exploring this, I think, look at where are their traditional forms and you know I've, I've studied music and i've studied martial arts and um, the way to develop in addition to different threads of herbal medicine i think the the common unifying thing amongst these that i'm, I'm always thinking about studying appreciating is you know you before you can experience freedom of movement freedom of playing on an instrument freedom of prescribing or formulating, learning forms and understanding the complexities of those forms and the simplicity of those forms, seeing them work, seeing them benefit people uh, is, is really the, the key to developing sensibilities of what's gonna work. You know, Cause I, I think there's people who get really into studying and really in their head and really into like, if I do it this way, it's going to be different because this teacher said this and you're like, well, have you seen herbs work? And they're like, no. And yeah. And I mean, I have my own variations on that theme of like the times that were headier and, uh, you know, always kind of questing for more information and details and granularities. And I was like, but, but now that I've 
seem, you know, plantain and calendula and chamomile and ginger really help people with irritable bowel syndrome, you know, or like a wide variety of inflammatory conditions of their gut. Like, the, you know, these are our rudiments in Western herbal medicine. You know, look, the other rudiments in Western herbal medicine are the tried and true tea bag companies that are at grocery stores across America, like really studying those and getting to know the situations for which those work and see like, here's where marshmallow and licorice and ginger and, you know, whatever combined for throat irritation. You know, I mentioned rose and Tulsi, you know, that's relatively new, but people have been combining rose and Tulsi for 25 years in tea bags across America. And, you know, looking at these simpler structures, feeling them in your body, giving them to people, understanding why they're helping and creating well-being or changes in tissue health um, or disease. It's okay to talk about disease. I'm not trying to sell something. Uh, it's really powerful. So I, like, I'm always looking to these. I'm always looking to these for inspiration. Um, we mentioned cooking, studying rudiments in cooking. Like you, you learn rudiments of sauce making or rudiments of spice blends as a hobby, obsession, passion of mine. And, you know, when we're talking about cooking for 100 people, you know, part of what we're doing is, you know, the, we, we gradually came to like where we never looked in cookbooks. Like bring 20 cookbooks and be like, you know, I didn't look at these last mm -hmm. year. This year I'm going to bring 10. I didn't look at these. So how do you how do you do that? You know, you develop these sensibilities by practicing and uh, learning how to improvise. And with Chinese medicine, you know, there's there's corpus of formulas that are there's a lot of Chinese medicine that's practiced as formulism. That is, you're not studying the individual herbs as much as you're studying the formulas and their actions and indications. There's a lot of practitioner traditions in which uh, people are only learning the formulas. Uh, Japanese Kempo, which is based on Shen Hanlun, Jing Wei Yala, 2000 year old classical Chinese herbal traditions that are practiced in Japan. They're all learned as formulas for specific sets of actions and indications uh, with some differentiation. A lot of people practicing with these uh, are not thinking about the individual herbs in them. A lot of practice of Chinese medicine, you know, contemporary Chinese medicine is not thinking about every individual formula within that structure. It's thinking of the role of the formula. So where and how can we study these building blocks with whatever herbal traditions we're using? Uh, I'm not thinking of which three herbs are in triphala every time I give somebody triphala, you know, so which, so what, what are in these structures and how can we develop relationships with these structures and understand how these structures intersect with human physiology um, in main, maintaining health and benefiting sickness. Uh, sounds like I'm marrying somebody whenever I say that. <laughs> uh, you know, is, is, is how I'm thinking about formulas. And then also for me, that's, you know, looking at the language of you know, that I learned working with Michael and Thomas and continue to study and think about as using Western herbs within the Chinese framework. And um, there are a lot of structures within Chinese medicine and structures for formulation where you're looking at how two and three herb herbs combine. It's called Dui Yao or, you know, formula pairing, that is herbal pairing. So medicinals, paired medicinals is Dui Yao. And so that's a kind of a school of thought that I continue to immerse myself in. And when you, when you read analysis of traditional Chinese formulas, you're always looking at flavor and nature and the relationships between the flavor and nature. You know, for instance, you know, we're, we're using a sweet acrid supplementing herb along with a bitter acrid draining and dispersing herb to achieve a certain outcome. And so taking that analytical framework and applying it to Western herbs based on analytical chemistry and comparative botany, et cetera, is how I think. <laughs> so, I, so just to reiterate, I really love how you started and that you're recommending, or at least saying from your personal experience, you're looking at structure first 
And kind of this, the images I got from that is like, you don't really hand someone a guitar who's never touched a guitar before and said, and say, okay, compose music, right? Instead, yeah. mo for most people, they're going to learn chords. They're going to learn the basic structure of music first. And just as like, we can't expect someone to like, if they've never baked anything in their life ever before, you can't just be like, okay, bake me a cake, right? We're going to, they need a recipe first. They need to understand that. And then as people get more advanced, they can like, they can create their own cake recipe or they can compose music, but we need those structures first. And I love that because I feel, sometimes I feel like people do rush to the formulation without understanding it. But what I love about what you said, Benjamin, is that it's not just a heady philosophical practice, but it's actually like, let's spend some time watching these wor herbs work ourselves and having that practical experience with them. So it's not just a like book training, so to say, so to speak. Um, and then, so it's kind of like one, some takeaways. And then the next is like, study what already exists, study the formulas that exist out there. And especially even looking at these two herb um, formulations that are classic that um, can be a starting place versus like creating a form, you know, just wanting to create a 20 herb formula out of, you know, thin air or whatever. It's kind of like it's, you're building these structures that you're talking about. Does that all seem like a good reflection of what you said? Yeah, I mean, those, those yeah. are good reflections of what I said. All right. Yeah, yeah I, I loved it all. Um, yeah, and something you said about about the you know like the practicality of it is so I teach herbal energetics a lot just the very basic like the tastes of herbs and yeah. feeling those and early on when I started teaching that I realized um, like somebody said to me something along the lines of like oh I have a warm constitution so I can't have ginger and I was like oh no 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 <laughs> please don't ever like don't like don't let that be the takeaway ever you know of like oh if I have a warm constitution I can't have a warm herb um especially when it comes to like these you know as you said these herbs that are like this kind of quintessential part of western herbalism um that we have to play around with things and try things for ourselves and see how they work and we're not necessarily worried about um i mean i would just never really worry about somebody with a warm constitution trying ginger right because it's all information and feedback that we're getting from those experiences um, what would you say about, you know, a big concern that people have about formulation is what herbs don't go together? Um, I think that, you know, with, within Chinese medicine, there's some very well-defined incompatibilities and all the incompatibilities tend to be really strong herbs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like we memorize these things as these maxims of truth. They're like, well, you don't, you don't combine licorice and you know, croton or like gopher spurge, or like how often, how often am I using gopher spurge? You know, I'm like, no. So um, I think that within Chinese medicine, I'm always looking at existing structures. And I don't, I don't know if there is a, I, I don't have a story about that, like what's actually incompatible, mm -hmm. you know, because I think um, building things out from smaller clusters that do work together. You know, I might be thinking about when to time things, mm -hmm. you know, that is, if I just to, you know, just a crude way of thinking about it without getting into pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics, like, if I take this thing, you know, at the same time as this other thing, is my body going to be able to hear it as well? Like if I take this tincture and that tincture at the same time that one's for my back pain and one's for my cough, hmm. you know, is my, is my body going to get the signal as clearly as if I take them a half hour apart mm -hmm. or an hour apart mm -hmm. uh, is a, is a consideration, but I can't think of real crystal clear. Like you shouldn't combine these because there's a maximum of truth in Western herbal medicine. Yeah. I feel the same way. I, in my classes, what I teach is that, um, like if you were an alien suddenly dropped on earth and you had no idea like about things, maybe you would put ketchup in coffee thinking that would be a good idea. Um, and then you would taste the ketchup in the coffee and probably that wouldn't be like something you would do. And so that's how I talk about herbal formulation is like, mm -hmm. there are some like ketchup and coffee situations, kind of like what you're saying. 
Um, could be timing, could be solubility issues, could be just kind of like two separate issues going on and combining them, kind of like you said. Yeah. But I'm not like, you could drink ketchup and coffee and you're going to be okay. It might not be fun, but you know, there's no like danger. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's, there's dosage incompatibilities, there's delivery system incompatibilities, but uh, there's things that might not make as much sense as other choices one might make. Right. There there's, a, yeah. there's, a, there's, there's countless of those. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, I know we talked about remain in the light, but just the um, formulation as a landscape, I think that's just a beautiful thing. And I wonder if do you have any other formulas that you've been inspired to create from the landscape or other examples? Um, yeah. You know, there's, there's a couple we were, we used to go every year and camp and teach in the high Sierra. And there are some, uh, comative sedative herbs that all grew near each other. And that was another example of uh, that, that we really enjoyed that were um, valerian and anemone, pulse, mm. like a pulsatilla, mm -hmm. and a couple different pedicularis. And so we'd, we'd make a combo of those. Um, and that was a very strong comative sedative. Yeah. In the same landscape, uh, Angelica Brewerei, uh, Ligusticum and uh, Osmoriza occidentalis, like three really strong aromatic antimicrobial APACA family herbs grew together. Hmm. And, you know, we'd, we'd make a couple of years, I made mead out of those, Ooh. Um, which was really fun. And yeah. also like to make tincture out of those as a, as a, you know, a really strong antimicrobial for yeah. flu season. Mm -hmm. uh, it also had, uh, they would also be useful for um, enteric infections, like GI GI disruptions due to food poisoning and whatnot. Mm. Well, those are great examples. I have a local bitters recipe I do, so it's um, all uh -huh. native plants for bitters. And then I I love to um, harvest herbs for like bath herbs, like, you know, do a summer solstice or something from my own garden and then have, mm -hmm. you know, like, so I can like s literally steep in my garden um, during the winter. <laughs> it's a nice, nice feeling. It's, you know, medicine on this, just a very beautiful and powerful level. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that resonates with you. It's a, it's a, so we, we, we get more and more from our garden and do less and less wild crafting. Mm -hmm. Definitely had some. My, my own personal ethical reservations about teaching wild crafting. Yeah, likewise, which is, um, yeah, also why it's, you know, the garden herbs have become kind of my materia medica now. Absolutely. I like to say Instagram ruined wild crafting for me. Yeah. yeah. Once I started to see people, people on like foraging sites go out, let's go forage California mm -hmm. peony. And I was like, what are you doing with that? They're like foraging it. I'm like, no. Yeah, yeah. And, Yep, that can be heartbreaking. Um, and yay for gardens and California yeah. poppy, which does grow in my garden. <laughs> um, anything else about formulation, Benjamin? Um, yeah, I mean, I think starting small, uh, some mm -hmm. of my, and starting small and looking at looking at good formulary textbooks. Um, if you go to Henriette Cress's website, where she has Remingtons and Scudders. I mean, some of it's focused on single plants, but if you go into these classic eclectic texts, you'll see formula structures that were used in botanical therapy 150, 120 years ago that are compendiums of great formulas. Go study those. You know, they're a lot of the same stuff is on the shelf today. Like those, that's a really great place to develop a sense of you know, one, what people were leaning on as a primary medicine, and that's what so many of the herbal educators, you know, today like to lean on. Another a really great one, if I have it within reach, uh, these, the Remington's Practice of Pharmacy of fun, have lots of, oh. uh, lots of great remedies. And then I think there's, there's an addition of that on Henriette's site. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Jillian Stainsbury's yes. book series that she put out. And, yes, absolutely. Um, she's, she's one of my favorite herbalists and a great, great educator and great human being and, mm -hmm. you know, really prolific author and put out this series of 
one of those may be in reach too. <laughs> I see them. Yeah, she's going to be on They're the show. They're just stuck on my shelf. These are really fantastic her herbal formularies for health professionals. You know, it's it's professional grade information, but it's rooted in an intersection of great phytochemistry and folk traditions. And so, you know, I think she really reached for something that was pragmatic and true to all these lineages that's, you know, heady and sophisticated like her. Uh, <laughs> heady and sophisticated enough for any physician who's going to pick this up and say, I want to do herb stuff, but also lots of really pragmatic stuff that if, you know, you're really rooted in the plants, you know, is also mm -hmm. really powerful. Mm, well said. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking now and I'm um, hoping to have her on the show in early 2024. So cool. yeah, Great. and Thomas Avery Grand too, who you've mentioned a couple times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. Um, well, you offer so much through Five Flavors Herbs. So I would mm -hmm. love to hear more about that. Um, just kind of like your gamut of offerings through the Five Flavors Herbs. You have yeah. your own formularies. <laughs> You're gonna, by bringing this up, you're distracting me and reminding me that I need to immediately close my computer after this and drive to our facility to supervise people. Uh, yeah, so you know we've we've been we've been an FDA registered facility for over a decade now, and mm -hmm. um, which means that we've invited people with badges and guns to come in and show up at any time unannounced. Uh, may happen. Uh, hmm. When the small business exemption was lifted from, you know, for GMPs, for good manufacturing practices, um, we were still making medicine in our house. And it was, a, you know, it was a nice stream of income. And we're like, this is an awesome stream of income. It really wasn't. But it seemed like it to us because we were uh, naive. <laughs> we're like, let's, let's find a place so that we can keep up this practice of making herbal extracts. and. You know, and, and doing our thing and do it legally. And so we did that and we did that in Oakland where we still have the vestiges of a brick and mortar retail apothecary. And hopefully hopefully by the time anybody listens to this, that won't be our responsibility anymore. Yeah, you're in transition and, right now. Yeah, yeah we're, we're working on that. Uh, but that's been a beautiful and powerful thing that I've been extraordinarily proud of to be part of the healthcare landscape as a herb shop, you know, mm -hmm. like it paid some dues and um, collaborated on creating an environment that facilitates access to herbs in a in a place where anywhere where there's people, it, you know, it's, it's going to be really beneficial if they can have high quality herbs that people can guide them to uh, with some skill and care. Uh, so that's one of the things we've done and also making an apothecary available where we talked about compounding, custom compounding, bulk herbs, tinctures, granules for people based on people's instincts, whims, experience, traditions, etc. cetera. Uh, that's something we plan to continue to do. Um, and that's now operated out of our Nevada city, Nevada County. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, we've been moving up here. So we actually built out a much larger place up here uh -huh. where we can do extraction and where we can compound and uh, ship stuff out wholesale. One, one of the things that we do that we didn't create, but we steward that I'm really proud of that is enjoyable for me is uh, we have a traditional Chinese formula line geared to that's um, dispensed and diagnosed based on good Chinese medical women's health diagnostics and basal body temperature geared towards fertility. And, uh, you know, when basically we bought this from one of our customers and we get to work with hundreds of Chinese medical practitioners who are focused on fertility and that are really smart and really well put together and really caring and supporting families in achieving their goals of having children. Hmm. And uh, we got a lot of feedback about that during the pandemic when people weren't putting acupuncture needles and people are like, you know, these herbs really work. I was like, hmm. well, I, I believe that. And I'm glad to get the input that you're not using all these hands-on, you know, needle insertion modalities that like mm -hmm. herbs are the main thing that you're influencing families physiology with to support mm -hmm. 
uh, to support reproduction. So, and at one point you were doing some webinars too. Is that What's something? That? At one point you were offering webinars. I think. Um, yeah, we 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 do. I mean, for people interested in that, reach out and we can share them with you because we have a whole cache of things related to that. Uh, uh, the summer, Thomas and I did a Thomas Garen and I did a, a class, a day long class that was related to uh, peri perinatal childbirth and uh, and also fertility, but more childbirth. Uh, and, and we use the term supporting families. And some somebody was very triggered by that. We got some hate mail about using the term families rather than women. Uh, oh. There was some gender essentialism going on there. Oh. Um, and we weren't talking about anything that complicated. Yeah. <laughs> Just families, because we think we're, they're families. So we, live, we families live in a world now where families is yeah, controversial. Or making families. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Even if it's just a two-person family, mom and baby. Yeah, and you offer webinars on all sorts of topics. As if I, I hope I remember this correctly, but I want to say not too long ago, which means at least in the past eighteen months, I maybe saw you do a webinar on Duyao. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. we've done classes on Duyao. Do a lot of mental health classes. Uh, do my wife Ingrid Bauer? She's a medical doctor and farmer and herbalist and. Uh, We've done quite a few classes on drug herb interactions and mm. uh, drug inter drug herb interactions and how to communicate about them and how to understand them um, in a cautious yet not fearful way. That is, you know, maybe how to advocate for herb drug interactions that are going to help people more and how to work in collaborative care teams. So we do a lot of interprofessional communication strategy education. Yeah, I, I love to teach. I've been teaching for a long time, and um, the business of teaching and promoting education has become more than we can manage. So as a result, we wind up doing a lot of free classes hmm. and keeping getting information out there and uh, try to try to engage our audience as a uh, as a community rather than people we're just trying to sell people to sell things to. Mm -hmm. So for better and for worse. Yeah. Well, I appreciate all your offerings. I'm on your newsletter and, um, you know, of course, just having known you as my teacher and as a fabulous cook for uh, so many years now, it's, just, it's been fun to watch uh, you and Ingrid grow and watch Five Flavors grow and, you know, just all of it. So very, um, very excited for you and all the transitions that are happening now as you just continue to blossom into your herbal path. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that's how it feels. feels. It feels like we're doing some molting. Hmm, molting, yeah, <laughs> getting down to the essential, yeah. yeah. And I and, and I appreciate the containers you've created and uh, you know all the all that you've done for the herbal community, Rosalie. Oh, thank you. you, you you've been out there for more than a minute. Yeah, yeah. It's oh. it's funny how that time goes by, huh? Um, yeah. It's funny just talking to you because it just brings up a lot of that, like, um, kind of you know back in the day of just being a. A fresh young student of the herbs so that's how i still feel i um, i do too you know absolutely yeah. there's every day that i'm an herbalist i'm reminding of all that there is to know that i don't yet know so well benjamin for this season i'm asking everybody people who's the people that they've learned from as a way to just kind of give a nod of respect to our teachers and i've heard you've mentioned thomas avery grant and michael mm -hmm. tierra um, we could talk about other people too. And I have another question that I'm, I just want to spring on you. So if you're yeah, open to it. Lay it on me. All right. Um, I love how you talk about like how herbs work. And you brought that like practicality of like, oh, before yeah. we get too far in our heads, like just feel the herbs work. And I'm wondering if you have any stories that come to mind of kind of like a time when the herbs surprised you when you were like, whoa, these, are, these herbs work. Um, you know, the story or just even, a, you know, in some ways that the herbs have surprised you. And feel free to take time to think about it. Uh, one thing that comes to mind, you know, that the, you know, we only have so much practical time to look at different methods, in, you know, in our lifetime. You know, like if I was, if I was treating 200 people a day, which, in, you know, in China, like there's herbalists who 
do tongue and pulse, ask five, five to 10 questions and write prescriptions. And there's a line out the door and they see 200 people a day. Yeah. And they have somebody filling the prescriptions and they have somebody scribing the pre prescriptions. That's not what's happening for me right now. I don't know about you and your community. Um, if I was doing that, I could practice, you know, here's, here's where I'm going to devote myself to Chinese herbal medicine. Here's where I'm going to devote myself to just Western herbal simpling or formulas with two or three nouns. And at some point, you know, I think it might be like a David Winston rudiment. There was like kava and um, ashwagandha and black cohosh for musculoskeletal pain. Uh, and I gave this to this woman and, you know, then gave her a healthy amount of it, gave her like four ounces of it and said, take this in these really liberal doses. Maybe there was another herb in there too. And I wanted to see if that rudiment worked. And nine months later, I see her again and you know, she's asking me about some different health condition. I'm like, well, what, what about this, you know, disabling, crippling pain that had you using a walker? I'm like, She's like, well, I, I took the herbs that you gave me and it, you know, it cured it. I was like, what is this person talking about? You know, it's like, I gave you four ounces of this tincture and, you know, the, you should have, you should have used that up. She said, I'm still taking it is what she said. Nine months later, I'm still taking that. And like my crippling rheumatoid condition went away. It's like, well, if you took it, like I directed you to, it should have been gone in like three weeks. I said, you know, take three to five droppers. She's like, oh, I thought you said three to five drops. Huh. And now, whether those herbs had anything to do with that or not, it, it really helped me shift my consideration that very small drop dosages may elicit more powerful effects than big amounts. And so... If that was her story, that that's what helped her get off the couch and go out and live an active life, that's amazing. If that was really those herbs, that's really amazing. It unrooted me from my story about what it means to use certain qualities of dosage. Hmm. You know, when an, another arena that herbs constantly surprise me, although I've really come to trust them, is you know more extreme states of consciousness. You know, I've worked a lot with people with schizophrenia and more substantial mental health concerns and or people choosing to elicit states of extreme states of consciousness through drug use. And that's becoming increasingly popular. So I think it's, or and, and or accessible and above ground. I think it's important to have tools to support people while they're, you know, rolling the dice with their consciousness that <laughs> herbs are really powerful for getting people out of psychiatric crisis mm. and can be really useful in conjunction with psychiatric medication and really help people be able to, you know, somebody who's having, having rage and has schizophrenia and is nonverbal um, might have some of that rage resolved by taking some herbs. Hmm. Uh, and so keep, keeping, keeping that, those dialogues alive, I think is really one of the more powerful places I've devoted myself. Hmm, that I'm still absolutely. pleasantly surprised that I can yeah. really support people in having a quality of life that is different than if you were basically putting somebody in a medication incarceration. Mm -hmm. Well, those are, those are great. That, that was very yeah. good off the cuff, how herbs surprise you. Thank you very much for sharing that. And um, yeah, I appreciate them both on different levels. I was also, you know, taught from kind of this Chinese medicine and Ayurveda perspective of very large dosages of herbs, which I personally like for myself most of the time. And I also had to unlearn that and just open my mind to other possibilities. And um, that story that you told is a really great example of that. I also just like, I just, when I hear those stories, I remember being in clinical practice and I would just be like, you know, like, some people just accept it like, oh, I took the herbs you gave me and I'm better now. Whereas like, I'd want that to be like headline news, you know, <laughs> like why did we start with that? <laughs> um, but yeah, the other thing that I would often say is people would come and be like, well, I don't know if it was the herbs, but now I don't use a walker anymore. I would always say like, oh, we always give the herbs all the credit. <laughs> and that's just yeah. my, that's my bias as, as an herbalist that, yeah, we, we give the herbs the credit. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, it's been really great to sit down and chat with you, Benjamin. And thank you for sharing so much about California poppy and formulation and how herbs surprise you. It's just been great to catch up with you. Yeah, likewise. Um, I hope we cross paths in a non-digital space before too long. I it's, hope so it's, too. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. Yeah. Well, I look forward to um, that. The, there is a, a rumor going around that in late May, there's going to be a kind of last West Coast throwdown at Quaker Center with the East oh, Coast. Oh, really? Oh, so interesting. It's going to be shorter. I think it's going to be like four or five days. Uh, oh, that's fascinating. You know, now that now that Thomas is running that school, mm -hmm. and it's going to be kind of a passing of the baton. I see. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad I'm they're doing that. that. Yeah, it'll be fun. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thanks for telling me about that, and thanks again for being here. Yeah. Thanks, Rosalie. Thanks for being here. Don't forget to head over to the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com to download your beautifully illustrated recipe card and get a transcript of the show. There, you'll also be able to sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is the best way to stay in touch with me. The best way to check out Benjamin's offerings is at his website at www.5flavorsherbs.com. If you'd like more herbal episodes to come your way, then one of the best ways to support this podcast is by subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks, and I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Also, a big round of thanks to the people all over the world who make this podcast happen week to week. Nicole Paul is the project manager who oversees the whole operation from guest outreach to writing show notes to actually uploading each episode and so many other things I don't even know. She really holds this whole thing together. Francesca is our fabulous video and audio editor. She not only makes listening more pleasant, she also adds beauty to the YouTube videos with plant images and video overlays. Tatiana Rusikova is the botanical illustrator who creates gorgeous plant and recipe illustrations for us. I love them. I know that you do too. Christy edits the recipe cards and then Jenny creates them as well as the thumbnail images for YouTube. Michelle is the tech wizard behind the scenes and Karen is our student services coordinator and customer support. For those of you who like to read along, Jennifer is who creates the transcripts each week. Xavier, my handsome French husband, is the cameraman and website IT guy. It takes an herbal village to make it all happen, including you. One of the best ways to retain and fully understand something you've just learned is to share it in your own words. With that in mind, I invite you to share your takeaways with me and the entire Herbs with Rosalie community. You can leave comments on my YouTube channel, on the herbswithrosaliepodcast.com show notes page, or simply hit reply to my Wednesday email. I read every comment that comes in, and I'm excited to hear your herbal thoughts on California poppy as well as herbal formulation. Okay, you've lasted to the very end of this show, which means you get a gold star and this herbal tidbit. California poppy is a beautiful plant within the poppy family. Its botanical name is Eschultzia californica. As Benjamin said, it's easy to grow in your garden. It's also an incredible sight to see in its native lands during super bloom years when the plants literally cover the hillsides with their golden blooms. California poppies are mostly that gorgeous orange color, though other colors do exist both in nature and as hybrids. Those beautiful blooms open with the sunlight and close at night and during cloudy days. The seed head looks a little bit like a sword rather than the oval type seed heads that you see on European and Asian poppies. The plants prefer to grow in sunlight in sandy and well-drained soils. They are drought tolerant and don't require soil amendments. Once they're established, they are often self-sowing. One of the best parts about growing California poppies are the pollinators. My favorite visitor is the sweat bee. This is a small native bee that has this brilliant neon green coloring. I remember the first time I saw a sweat bee and I just, I just couldn't even believe that such a being existed. It was just so beautiful. California poppy is truly a beautiful medicine that can bring much needed rest to our nervous systems.